so I'm Mike. Uh, I'm from Gold. Uh, if, if anyone doesn't know, as we have international audience here, it's quite a big right heading company, born in Estonia, uh, and I do data science there. So today I'd like to tell you about uh, scaling data science and the quality challenges that may come with it. But before I start, I'd like to know you a bit better too. Uh, could you please raise your hand if you have some big data, data science or machine learning in your company? Nice. And how many of you have tried the machine learning model or did something like that? Nice. So, looks like I'm in the right company. Uh, usually when data science is mentioned, uh, uh, People think that it is something like uh, tuning machine learning models, or the most interesting thing about this is tuning machine learning models, or digging in big data, uh, or more accurately, like solving business challenges with data. But to me, uh, currently, as of like May 2019, the most interesting thing about data science, uh, as I discovered, is uh, the complexities that emerge when you're like uh, building your amazing team, solving stuff, uh, scaling your system, and uh, uh, some interesting issues emerge that are not told in any like online courses or universities. And uh, how you exactly solve those challenges is uh, uh, what separates the first model on the laptop of your first data scientist and actually put this, how do you call it, artificial intelligence to work for you. Uh, so a bit of history. Uh, uh, there was a company named Taxify, and then something happened. It was quite a small company, well, medium-sized. Uh, then it started to grow massively. Uh, in about like last two years, it grew 20 times. So it became uh, quite an interesting mess. And uh, like speaking of data, and speaking of everything that's going on uh, in the systems, and it was decided about one and a half years ago to create. Yeah, one and a half years ago, to create a data science team to figure that out. Uh, and I was there from the very beginning. So uh, what was before the data science team was created and before all this started to become developed? There was a lot of uh, good software. It was in the cloud. It was in the Amazon cloud. There were a lot of, like, Node.js microservices, MySQL database, well, like, uh, everything as usual. Uh, there were also like uh, good testing practices, uh, component tests, integration tests, unit tests, well, some unit tests were missed here or there, but like everyone does that. Everyone sometimes is lazy to write unit tests. Uh, but then uh, data science came and actually in the beginning uh, no one understood uh, what we are doing. Everyone was calling us data magicians. I could have a t-shirt saying data magician. Uh, but then, uh, slowly, uh, what could be noticed is that development and product meetings started to become taken over by data science. Like every th everything became related to the questions of data. And a lot of big wins also uh, became related to data science. So it, be it like some new data science product or some report uh, that was like trying to figure out what's going on or there was some new feature in the software and we had to analyze what is this influence. So data science uh, took part in that too. And of course a lot of new interesting issues started to come up uh, which had to be dealt with and thought before they actually are able to cause some fires. We're at the QA conference, right? So uh, in the, uh, it took us one and a half years to get here where we currently are now. But let's try to actually uh, build a company in 30 minutes uh, and see how it will work out. So my first, like, we have software and we have software with machine learning. I will use data science and machine learning interchangeably, so please forgive me for that sometimes. So what is the difference uh, with and without machine learning? Well, uh, when you train a machine learning model, you actually train it based on data, and then you integrate it in your, to your software. So uh, uh, basically, the data becomes your code, so the line between code and data becomes blurred. And uh, because data is non-deterministic, any kind of stuff can happen there. And because some like random machine learning models, training your machine learning model starts with random initialization, then your software, your logic also becomes non-deterministic. Like you have no idea what your logic is uh, in, in, if you go into detail. Uh, and uh, 
imagine that you would write uh, like some uh, class, for example, Java class file where you have if, if else's and like 500 levels of uh, 500 levels of if else's. I guess that wouldn't go through a code review with your uh, colleague. But if you, for example, incorporate a decision tree model in your software, then that's actually what happens, in essence. And uh, quality, uh, well, with a lot of uh, ordinary software quality is whether your feature works or not, whether it uh, behaves according to the spec or not. Uh, but with machine learning, when something like, when you have some number that is shown to the user, for example, uh, then uh, it becomes quite context dependent and subjective. For example, if you have price, or price for a ride and boat, then uh, uh, what is exactly the accurate price? There is some range of prices that are acceptable for the user, for example, and it might depend on like time of day, weather, on the user's mood. So what is a quality price? What will lead to complaints or churn? Uh, it is actually becomes quite subjective. And again, if we continue with this example of price, then if we have five components that influence the price, uh, well, they make price uh, better or more accurate from one side, from another, from third, then uh, they uh, in inevitably start influencing each other. So, uh, I mean, like in, in software you have one, for example, in some program you have one tab, second tab, third tab, and they don't mess with each other. But with machine learning components it is often not the case. Uh, so, uh, that's the difference between software uh, and what about the people? who are actually building these models and building this, uh, uh, take part in building this software, the data scientists, where they... Uh, uh, my impression is that I can never be sleepy or ignorant at work, so I have to be always like, hmm, okay, I did this cool thing, but I cannot relax, I need to talk to my colleague and uh, think, uh, figure out what they think, oh my god, what if these things go, go wrong? I should go to another team and talk to them. So basically, I have to uh, be all the time, I have to all the time think uh, critically uh, at, ev at every moment. Uh, uh, because like, if the software, in some sense it can be said that, especially with automatic retraining of the models, uh, if, uh, the model is your software and there is an automatic retraining of your models, then uh, it can be said that software changes itself by itself. So it's like a ground that's like, moving under your feet. Uh, and uh, when it becomes uh, stressful, then uh, I remember this advice from the Fight Club movie. Uh, yeah. So, uh, uh, but uh, I got a bit carried away with talking about difficult stuff related to data science. So, uh, there are actually a lot of benefits to data science, so when it is actually needed. Uh, uh, one reason when, it is, when data science uh, becomes needed is uh, when you basically cannot hard code your logic into if, uh, hello? Uh, into if, into if else statements or in an ordinary code, uh, and you need to, like, uh, you need to make decisions based on data. For example, the, I guess the purest and uh, a purest case of uh, is uh, image or speech recognition. Like uh, in this case, you can never, uh, you always have to have some kind of machine learning. And uh, uh, if your software has to adapt to changing environment then uh, usually some data science or some machine learning is needed too. So it will be able to learn from the data and what's currently going on and incorporate that. And uh, as efficient as your business gets, uh, there is always like 10% on the table, uh, uh, which we uh, actually uh, came face to face one and a half years ago, that uh, there's always like some hidden relationships in the data or some uh, sub-optimalities for example, in how city performs, and there is always like 10% that is not tapped into. So we need to use uh, machine learning to actually like go deeper, which human cannot understand. Uh, and uh, there are also a lot of awesome B BI tools uh, to analyze your data in your company, uh, but uh, it's not always the case that BI tools can help you uh, because like their capacity is sometimes limited and some uh, complex analysis, again, complex analysis of your data is needed. 
or again we have uh, such types of data as images or speech so uh, a data scientist would help out there too uh, so uh, basically we had all of those cases one of the one and a half years ago uh, when we started and uh, let's now go through uh, the very beginning to the very end uh, following how this complexity grows well first things first uh, First things first, uh, imagine that, uh, well, you're a passionate data scientist who just came and uh, uh, the business ask you, asks you how to improve the demand supply balance in the city. And you are like, yeah, I'm going to solve all these challenges. Uh, I'm going to improve the demand supply balance in the city. And you start coding something or creating models. But an important thing to ask first is like, what is demand, what is supply, what is balance, how do I actually measure it? Is it like finished rights or is it like money earned? So uh, a data scientist in essence is like an analyst and developer and QA in one person. Uh, and uh, even if those business questions are clear, then uh, there's a, of course, I, I'm not talking even about missing or broken data, but for example, you have well, you want to predict weather and you have daily weather data, but daily weather data is not enough. It may work nice on your like computer, but you actually need hourly weather data. So that is also related to data quality issues. Uh, and sometimes uh, there's a very embarrassing, there are very embarrassing moments in the life of a data scientist when uh, uh, basically uh, they created an awesome model that works perfectly. They get a lot of glory. Uh, from everyone else, but then put it into life and it doesn't work. If, because they actually took something that already describes the future and they put it into the model. So, of course, in life there is no future, in life there is only present. So, it's called data leakage. And uh, uh, one more is that it always makes sense to start with very simplest model because it will, uh, for example, you can all start with a neural network or some fancy gradient boosted trees model, but uh, uh, and it even will, will work fine, but it will waste a lot of resources on debugging it, on uh, retraining it, on providing the necessary infrastructure. So maybe a simplest linear model would be, like, would be totally enough. So that, that are uh, all the questions that need to be asked even before like, the first uh, line of code is written. And uh, now, uh, as the model was created, or some like prototypes were being done, then there's a like we get to deployment. Uh, well, apparently we have something that worked on a data scientist computer, but now uh, the thing with data scientists uh, is that uh, they are not software developers, and some may not have any like uh, software development background. A lot of them actually, some come from academia, and uh, they're. Uh, well, I'm not saying anything bad about uh, academic code, but it, there it is a means to an end and it's not a production grade code. So here you need to be in love with your developers. The designers should be like in very warm relationships with developers so they could help them get their things straight. And uh, then uh, after, um, then uh, there comes a the question of integrating all this. Because even if the model is good, like based on what data science is created, then uh, when we get to live system, then uh, everything may break. May break because there is simple, simply uh, the data that was used for creation of the model. It is not available in live. Or, for example, uh, there is no place actually where to put this model into into backend because well, there are no integration points and uh, you cannot just hack inside the architecture because uh, hack inside the code because your architect won't allow you to do that so uh, uh, the thing with data scientist communication uh, data scientist developer communication is that uh, they're all well intentioned but they have their own like field of expertise and they often can't think along with each other but they should like take the best effort to do that. Uh, so when uh, the things are in life, then oh my god, this is a very complicated slide. We'll put it here. Uh, so uh, when everything is in life, then you have to actually measure uh, how is it now working. Uh, you have some like old feature, you have new feature, new, uh, different versions, and uh, one of the 
like usual things how to do that is A-B testing. Uh, well, how many of you know what A-B test is? Of course. Uh, so, um, it's when you basically create equal treatment and control groups. You assign like uh, users with old feature to a control group and users with new feature to a treatment group. And then you like uh, let uh, the data to be collected for some time and you see the difference. There are different types of statistical tests and uh, like again the question is which metric to use. Uh, but like it's a big topic on its own. Uh, there, there's also an issue that uh, Sometimes two teams, they may decide that, okay, I'm going to take the user ID of a user and like, if it's dividable by two without remainder, then uh, if it's an even number, then it will be treatment. And if two teams don't know about such, like what other team did, and they all uh, start running such a test, then like their results will be messed up and there will be wrong conclusions on what, will, what works and what not. So, uh, to avoid all those issues, uh, to like how, to, how to choose the right metric, how to choose the right test, how to avoid like bad randomization, we created our own uh, A-B testing, A -B testing tool. We uh, actually, with this like um, creation of tools by themselves, and, well, we evaluated, uh, for all such thing, we evaluated what is there on the market, and uh, uh, Basically, uh, out-of-the-box tools for A-B testing or for whatever else related to data science is good for the company which doesn't have their own capability for data science. So, like, you just buy from someone and it's good enough. Uh, you can do your data science work. But if you actually have a data science capability in your company, then you might need, you might want additional flexibility or you need some features. So, uh, most of the tools that we do, we create ourselves and do proper QA in them. Uh, but uh, when, uh, okay, so the question of how to implement it is solved, but then there's a question of like interpretation. So we have that new feature is actually 2% gives 2% like difference in means uh, for, 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 I don't know, for finished rights or for like total money, total income earned is 2% and your business person would like to like, uh, here a conclusion that now we are earning 2% more money, which is like totally great. But 2% uh, difference in means is not 2% difference in money because the variance of the data, I mean, how much it variates, it might be uh, so high that like this 2% occurred by chance. And we have to look at confidence intervals to actually understand that uh, what you can say with confidence, with 90% confidence, for example, is that everything in just by uh, half percent, or even like not increased at all. So no jumping to conclusions here. And imagine that you're, imagine that you want to like figure out something about new users, how they convert, how they, like if their behavior will be better. But your user actually makes a first write two weeks after the registration. And uh, you deploy a new feature and uh, immediately like millions of users register on the first day and you have enough data to reach statistical significance and to draw a conclusion and you see that basically no one did it right. And you came to the conclusion that, okay, it doesn't work. But actually you, you need to always know the context, getting back to the question of like always thinking and not being sleepy. Uh, you need to always know the context that, uh, what, what is it exactly behind your data. And uh, again, speaking about statistical significance uh, is, uh, well, like there's a metric called p-value uh, that uh, shows uh, with which probability the change might have occurred by chance. And usually good p-value to say that the change is statistically significant is 0.05, but if you have a lot of tests, for example, have, if you have 50 tests in your systems, then it is like 92% that totally by random, some may be statistically significant. So, uh, uh, interpretation is tricky here as well. And uh, we are all only measuring short-term effects, like what was the user conversion, for example, with a new feature. But there are also long-term effects, which are often dismissed. Uh, like, uh, what was the user, what, in the end it matters, what is the user retention? So maybe the user uh, did something which uh, is good for you, but they became like angry at you and in two weeks they will leave. So long-term effects also matter. Uh, there is also a more advanced side to statistical testing. 
It's um, uh, one thing that we also use is our interleaved tests. For example, when you need to, like, again, this question of market balance, demand supply balance, uh, you cannot, uh, like, uh, Take two algorithms that balance the demand supply in the city and run them in parallel as a normal A-B test. So you use interleaved A-B test when you run one algorithm for an hour, then for the next hour another algorithm, then like etc. So this way you can actually measure, like compare them as closely as possible. There also also thing called bandit test. Bandit tests uh, name not too good for PR, uh, but uh, it actually like points to a problem in probability theory called like multi-armed bandit problem. Uh, that shortly it states that you're in the casino, you basically have a lot of slot machines, you know that some will pay more, so you pull the levers of all machines first randomly, but then you see what your payoff will be, and uh, you kind of like converge to an optimal solution to earn the most money and to pull only the right machines. So uh, bandit tests uh, apply to like uh, testing of which feature is good, which feature is bad, means that this algorithm, bandit testing algorithm, it assigns users uh, randomly to like different options and like different groups of users to different options, smaller ones, and then uh, like changes them all the time and converges much more quickly to an optimal solution than an A-B test where you like have three weeks of testing and you are basically giving out feature to all the users for three weeks, which like is a waste of, can be a waste of time. But it's more complex and less interpretable, so be careful with that. And there are also some changes that may be too complicated to implement or uh, just impractical or maybe unethical uh, to like test in, uh, test uh, involving the real people, involving the real city. So for those things, uh, a, simulation, a simulation engine is a good thing. So uh, we have um, Magic City in a simulator, which basically like mirrors every city that we have. So if we need, for example, test something that would be bad to test in a real city, like something that might affect driver earnings, for example, then we run it on simulator and we see how it works. That's the more advanced type of statistical testing beyond A-B tests. And uh, yeah, it, it had to happen some, uh, at some point that now it's on life and it works well. And uh, now there are life issues. Uh, basically, data science is never 100% precise, so um, it's never 100% precise, and uh, basically there is always 1% that, that you didn't account for, and you better think about how you will handle that 1% before there will be like some complaints or court cases. Uh, uh, usually you handle this 1% of corner cases that a machine learning model can, can handle uh, by um, implementing some simpler fallbacks that work, like, even in some extreme cases. Uh, and um, there might also uh, a type of a life issue when, again, from our experience, uh, we have a city where something is going on, and uh, um, some major road repair in the center of the city happens. So uh, the whole center of the city suddenly becomes an extreme case instantly, like overnight, because some traffic signs were put up. Uh, so uh, for, for all of those cases, uh, and retraining doesn't help because it just happens immediately and your retraining cycle is two weeks. Uh, so for all those cases, uh, good monitoring is what is needed. Again, ideally with automatic fallback on something simpler. And uh, uh, I thought, uh, I had a um, uh, moment of enlightenment one time when I understood what, what is actually what actually is a good monitoring. That I created one thing, one one, co one component that had machine learning inside it, and I created some dashboards that show the behavior of like everything that's going on with this component. But uh, somehow, like people didn't want to use it, they were like coming to me and asking me questions. Okay, so I created another dashboard which was supposed to be better, but it still didn't help. So people were still like totally ignoring the dashboard that I created. And then I created a third dashboard a bit later, or it's like hopeless. And then suddenly like everyone forgot about me and uh, they stopped asking me and, but, and even more they started sharing my graphs from the dashboard with each other. So I understood like that good monitoring is when people like don't come 
uh, don't come to you, but uh, come to your monitoring, and they never ask you. And the good monitoring is, is also when uh, you know of issues uh, before they happen or before someone comes to you. So I guess the nice metric to measure the quality of your monitoring is like not something technical, but people. Uh, do complaints reach you, or are they mitigated before? Like, what questions and complaints, or are they mitigated before? Uh, so, hello. Uh, uh, everything is alive and issues is fixed, so I guess now it's time to relax and uh, congratulate yourself that everything is working. But uh, the thing is that, mm, okay, you have your models in life, but now you actually need to deal with retraining of those models, and again you have to ask to some questions, not about issues, but just questions about how, how this works, how that works, how, how, everything, like, how, how, how everything is going on, and probably you had some also nice ideas how to implement one, how to make one thing or another better, or you left some technical debt. Uh, or uh, you need to implement some better monitoring again, so uh, it's a waste of precious uh, like uh, data scientist time. So and we at, at some point we found ourselves also in a position when a lot of our time goes to this constant maintenance of what we created. So the solution for us was again uh, there are also some like two some packages on the market that do this, but we created our own data science platform, which basically deals with all of this. Uh, starting from data ingestion to model retraining to monitoring, so these things can be offloaded to like a single place, which uh, can deal with it perfectly without us to having to do some manual work. Because uh, manual work is always like a possibility of human error. You might be a very wonderful person, uh, and you might be very very like uh, attentive and suspicious, but when there are ten people who do ten things then it's only a matter of time when something will break. Uh, and anyway, you, you, you would want to like, do more interesting stuff than simply maintenance of your old work. Uh, so, bad models and all data science products don't live in a vacuum because uh, they, have some, they get some in inputs from other systems and uh, they uh, also, like, uh, influence the world. So, uh, there can, in an ideal world, there will be like no issues with your inputs, and uh, the world will tell everything that the model said it to, to do. But uh, in reality, you have to think before like you deploy that what could be the upstream issues. Where could inputs go wrong, for example, if there is a bug in an upstream system? Because if your feature is user-facing, that you will get all the blame first and you would have to figure out this mess. And uh, there are also interesting cases when, for example, a model influences the world, it incentivizes people to do something, so basically the world is changed because of the model, then on next retraining the model learns it, then it incentivizes like people to change again, so you, you get it. There can be like a loop that spirals out of control. And uh, uh, don't, don't look at me like that, I didn't mess up like that. So uh, there is an amazing paper by Google called Hidden Technical Debt in Machine Learning Systems. Uh, I recommend it, a wonderful read. Basically in software development there are anti-patterns, there are architectural flaws that will lead to the problems down the road sooner or later. Basically this paper, Hidden Technical Debt in Machine Learning Systems, it describes the same thing but for systems that use like data science. Uh, recommend it. So, uh, sooner or later there will be like systems that consist not only of one model or something probabilistic, but of multiple models that work in the chain. So, uh, here we have something like some demand, some supply, some prediction, some real-time stuff. And basically on each stage, because data science is never 100% precise, errors accumulate and the output might be like total garbage. So, uh, in order to like handle this, uh, uh, well, one thing is again how to somehow cleverly think how to make errors not accumulate or cancel each other out on each step, but the like, rule of thumb is to make your system as end-to-end -end as possible. So if some stages can be unified, then uh, uh, ditch the pretty flowchart and make it just one box. So if some like 
processing and aggregate demand and combining can be unified into one model, they go for it because the errors will become smaller. And you have tools uh, to quickly, like if there is some issue, then you could see the basically the development of your model, you should in parallel develop a tool uh, where you can give, in case of issue, you can give an input to this tool and it will show how the issue propagates through the system and you will immediately see like everything, how it was working. And then um, we are getting to kind of a like quite abstract, almost philosophical level that uh, when you have several systems in place, like again, you have, you have a city, in our case we have a city, basically we have a market, and we have, for example, pricing, which uh, again consists of many systems, and we have campaigns, which also influences the market in some way. So they are actually influencing also each other because they are dealing with the same people. Uh, but they are working towards the same goal, to make uh, life better for everyone. So uh, more data science and more software engineering wouldn't help at that stage. It would make only things messier. So what is the good, what, what is the solution for this? is that if you have a market, well, you, you should have a theory of how everything works together. Like, more experimentation and more hacking uh, uh, won't help. If it is a market, then you should have an economic theory for how everything works. Then, uh, um, there was a lot of scientific papers uh, basically also, for example, from the companies similar to ours and from other companies like Airbnb or something else that actually at one stage had to deal with the question of how to put a solid theory underneath what they are doing. Uh, only with theory, like, you will really understand what's going on and can, like, make it a basis for decision making for your models and for yourselves. So, uh, data science, uh, well, quite a young field, still, well, in, in its modern definition at least, uh, especially if we consider like the mass adoption in enterprise and companies. So, um, uh, it's still like a lot of things had to be figured out and uh, that's why I thought data science is interesting. And uh, mm, back when I came to Bolt, I was actually, wasn't quite sure that, well, when we just started doing data science, I wasn't quite sure that it will work out because like so many data science initiatives fail uh, because of the reasons I mentioned above. And uh, But now I see how data science uh, it touches basically everything there and uh, does a lot of um, a lot of benefit for us. So I'm quite happy that I was involved in that from the start. And uh, I wish you all also to good luck in building your own quality rocket ships. Thank you. Thank you, Misha. So we uh, have a little tradition here in the Nordic testing days. So there is a task that me and my, my fellow teammate Carlos, we always carry out, especially during keynotes, but all the other all the other speeches in the in the main hall. It's called QA. It means question assurance. So uh, we first give you a chance. So you can ask questions, and if there are no questions, uh, sometimes we have a spike of inspiration and we ask one ourselves. And sometimes we're, you know, tired and lazy. That's most of the time, and uh, we just pick somebody randomly uh, to ask a question. So no pressure. But uh, any questions? Lots of them. Uh, I saw Raimo was here first, second, third. Yeah, we, we, it looks like we need to have an auction soon. Yeah. Okay, so thank you for the talk. Uh, and actually, I have a question about the monitoring dashboards that you said. You said um, you created multiple iterations of them, and finally, people actually started to use them. Uh, did you notice what was the pattern that really made people use the dashboards? Can you go more into details about that? Um, well, probably, um, I think it's related to, uh, well, basically I digested uh, all the questions that get got from the people and I also thought, 
uh, what would I like to truly see myself based on my experience, what was still not clear. So basically I put myself into other people's shoes and then I created uh, what was actually needed and something more. So uh, probably from the first iteration you uh, cannot know in advance uh, everything that is needed and this is a work in progress. But uh, it's better to uh, empathetically talk to everyone uh, about what what is actually needed? Um, <clears throat> what was your background when you started on data science first? Mm. Uh, well, first off, I started with uh, I started my my career, IT career, as a software developer. I was a Java software developer. Then I, at some point, I thought like I well, that hype of all big data and machine learning started at that point. It was like 2013, 2014, and I thought like, wow, I should like do, I should, I should go there. Uh, it sometimes reality was more sobering that it wasn't as fancy as applying neural networks on big data, but it was much more interesting in other things like the ones I talked above and about actually solving real business problems and being between engineering and business and basically being everywhere at once and doing everything at once. So yeah, I started about four years ago and before I was a software developer. Hi, Ann. I'm really interested in the, oh, sorry. Hi, I'm really interested in the simulator. So can you tell me a bit more about it? So were you replaying data? What kind of cities were you using? Were they imaginary cities? Like, tell me all about your simulator. Mm -hmm. Okay, uh, so basically simulator, uh, well, uh, if we need to test something in Tallinn, for example, then we uh, we have historical data for Tallinn, and we estimate some parameters. What 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 is Tallinnness of this city? And uh, basically, we have an OSRM engine, OpenStreetMaps engine, beneath underneath it. So uh, uh, basically, we take those parameters: how cars move, how people order, and all other stuff that like makes a city a city and uh, we feed it into the simulator and those virtual cars start driving around and people start making orders and uh, in the end we see the result and of course how we validate if the city is good uh, we like take some historical data which we know what ha already know about this what happened we run it in simulator we see that it's like 99 percent accurate so then we can see experiments for things that we haven't yet seen mm -hmm. so how do you know the uh outcome ahead if you change the parameters. Uh, what do you mean? How do you know the outcome ahead? I mean, if people's behavior patterns change, uh, I mean, how can you predict that? Uh, well, um, in some sense, it is always a risk that, yeah, we can, we can say that simulator in this city works uh, perfectly based on historical data, but then again, there are major road repair in the center of the city, and like, uh, nothing works so there is always a risk there is never a hundred percent so we have to be suspicious and smart <laughs> okay there's one here in the back hi first i want to say i'm a big fan of both i'm using it as much as i can afford thank you so i have a customer complaint question mm -hmm. about the uh, predicted arrival times i have yet to see a car arriving sooner than predicted mm -hmm. but often they arrive later so my question is, is it a business uh, decision to show shorter arrival times so that the customer wouldn't uh, open a computing application? Or is it actually a prediction problem? And if it's a prediction problem, how come it always wrong in one direction? <laughs> Thank you for this great question. Uh, mm, it is a... Uh, we had some issues with ETA, and uh, basically it is a like, constant work to improve it, but uh, actually no, it is not a business decision to underestimate it, uh, just in some cases there might be like inaccuracies, but uh, I will, will take into account that this might bother people and we'll think what we can come up with. Thank you. That was a very politically correct answer. <laughs> <laughs> um, over here. Yeah. Oh, you can stand up. Yeah. Um, 
there's a great talk. Thanks for that. Uh, I had a quick couple of questions based on what you said. I see that Bolt is like scaled across different countries right now, so they have a lot of data. So I'm just curious in terms of how many models are usually are we're training in parallel, and how many data scientists Bolt has right now. Like I, I'm just curious to know how uh, things work. Mm -hmm. Well, currently there are uh, 11 data scientists and uh, speaking of models, it's about, um, well, uh, a couple of hundred. So, um, some are uh, retrained automatically, some are moving towards automatical retraining. Uh, so currently, like, it is already much more than one person can handle. I have a question as well. Mm -hmm. I'm over here. Yep. Look to the right. The other way, yeah. mm -hmm. um, are you able, I mean, I suppose you have some prediction models in place for uh, predicting demand. Mm -hmm. So how far off are we from the situation that a taxi will arrive before I even order it? Mm -hmm. uh, I think we are quite far from this because uh, we can predict the demand on aggregate like what will be the total demand in some district or in the whole city, but uh, it's hard to predict whether this particular person would be at this particular moment. Of course, some people ride very regularly, like you really ride at 9 a.m. and at 5.30 5 p.m., but I guess it would be very creepy if a car would arrive instantly, so <laughs> it's not a, good, not, not a good decision. Yeah, please go ahead. Mm -hmm. so, have you noticed a culture change outside of the data science team in the company since you started relying on machine learning to, to improve application? Mm -hmm. uh, well, basically, when we started off, it was like uh, said that uh, now we have to become a data driven company, and now we actually ha have to make our decisions based on data. Everyone said that. Of course, it was. In the beginning, it was not clear like how exactly to make decisions based on data and what uh, these guys doing and how to cooperate with them. But like everyone was like inclined to educate themselves, and we educated ourselves too. So uh, the culture, like the intention, was there. The culture, culture shift was gradual. So you mentioned uh, some about errors and, and problematic behaviors. How do you think about like emergent? Emergency procedures, do you have models for those kind of things as well? Mm, emergency procedures, you mean? Uh, to handle erroneous behavior and, and take care yeah. of problematic situations. Mm -hmm. uh, yes, uh, uh, basically, when you have some model or some algorithm that is somehow uh, quantitative, then uh, how to say? As I said, you have 1% of some extreme cases and you have to think of a simpler fallback on which you can fall back. Maybe it would not be so convenient or so like uh, efficient, but it will handle these cases, avoiding bigger problems. And basically this fallback is not bad, it is just like normal, what was before data science. So like it's a, anyway, it's a plus or zero. And those fallbacks are deterministic or do you have models deciding what the fallbacks are? Uh, currently deterministic. Hello. Mm -hmm. Thanks for the talk. Uh, now you mentioned Google, and uh, Google used to be a search company. Yeah. Over the years they, they say now that they are a machine learning company which only does search and other things. Uh, do you think the same will happen with Bolt or do you believe the models will get uh, more opaque or black boxy over time or will they be like, uh, suppressed or uh, switched over with theories that everybody understands? Thanks. Mm. Uh, I was speaking of Google, uh, yeah. It became, a, it first was a search company, then it's mostly like, okay, search still generates a lot of its business, but it is also the most advanced artificial intelligence research company in the world currently. And uh, maybe we'll get into that place too. And speaking of black box and speaking of interpretability of models, then on one side, like the most black box models, there, there are neural networks and gradient boosted trees, they, or neural networks especially, they like, 
can give additional efficiency, but they can be hard to debug. And then there is also a question of GDPR and how we actually interpret the decision. So uh, there is always be a trade-off. We don't know the answer in advance how it will be in three years, but we will try to uh, like come up with the best decision possible. Practical question: How we work in teams now? Since you switched from uh, from the product owners who were making decisions one and a half years ago, now it's that the science, data science, which makes a decision. How does it work? Do you have still product owners or data scientists kind of uh, took this role over? Uh, not quite. We actually have product managers. Uh, we actually have product managers, and uh, basically, if we are talking about some area or some component, then we operate in virtual teams. So there are like a product manager, data scientist, or data scientists, developer of developers. So they are like kind of working together, and uh, uh, data scientist actually is expected to like be proactive about product decisions to give some advice. Uh, but yeah, of course, the main uh, product management responsibility is a product manager who is a dedicated person for that. Okay, I think we'll uh, do the last question now. Yeah. In, in the beginning of the speech, you mentioned the, the challenges with the machine learning, and you, you said that logic is non-deterministic. Mm -hmm. Could you elaborate that? Is that really necessary? Uh, Non-deterministic? Well, I guess uh, it's not a question of necessary or not necessary, but uh, it's, um, how to say, it's just what happens. Because the data that you train your model on, it's non-deterministic by nature. I mean, today, even for the same ride, for example, you take a ride to work, uh, today evening or two, two. Uh, one day it's like 13,000 meters, another day it's 13, uh, 1,002 meters, so it's, it, it's not deterministic by, by, by definition. And uh, the model learns based on that, and so the model and the software will not be incorporated, becomes non-deterministic as well. Okay, thank you all for the questions. Uh, unfortunately, there was no need for question assurance, uh, but we're working on it. But a big round of applause to Misha. Thank you. Uh, as we all know, then uh, your work keeps you up at night, probably. Looks like it. Um, so we have a little goodie bag for you. Uh, in there, there is uh, like a kit that helps you sleep, like an animal. I don't know if it's a good thing or a bad thing, uh, but let us know the results, okay? Yeah, okay. Thank, Thank you. you so much. Uh -huh. The final version of the slides at midnight. So yeah, in some sense. So there you go. Yeah. Okay. Bye.